Um, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, um, I guess most of you know me. I'm Gabriele Matzner, um, a former active uh, diplomat and a member of the Redaktion of the team of the journal Internationale uh, since my retirement a couple of years ago. And this, um, and this um, magazine on um, international affairs, as the title says, Internationale, is uh, celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. And uh, on the occasion of this anniversary, there are two, at least uh, two discussions. One that already took place last week on the question of the Middle East and where is the Austrian politics on the Middle East, which used to be a very active one. And uh, the second uh, discussion is uh, tonight. And I thank you for coming in spite of all this uh, weather and other circumstances. Um, and it is devoted to the question of the left. Uh, with the left, where are we going? Uh, 40 years ago, it was during the times of uh, Bruno Kreisky as Austrian Chancellor, and in other countries too, and thinking of uh, Willy Brandt, Olaf Palme, and all these personalities. Uh, the social democracy, traditional left, if you so want, was uh, still a force to reckon with, and since then it's been going down, with some some change, some changes here or there, but basically down all over Europe. And um, we want to ask um, ourselves, uh, where are, where do we come from? Where do, where are we going? Especially more than where are we from? And I'd like to also mention the fact that uh, my uh, late husband, who some of you might have known, uh, Egon Matzner, who was uh, in charge of um, organizing the party program of the SPÖs, uh, also some 40 years ago. Um, and his last book um, was uh, dedicated to Austria and part of it, of course, to the demise of the Social Democrat Democratic Party. Um, Egon Matzler would have, um, would have been 80 years, um, now 81 years of age, and uh, this, discussion is also devoted to him. I'd like to briefly introduce and uh, welcome uh, speakers tonight. To, uh, to my left is uh, Chantal Mouffe. She's a very well-known um, uh, political scientist, professor in London, born Belgium. She has written uh, numerous books, articles. She's also a political activist who knows almost uh, every leftist uh, thinker or politician all over Europe. And currently she's um, spending some time, some weeks in, in Vienna as a fellow at the Institut für die Wissenschaft von Menschen. Her latest uh, books, which are also translated into German and I think are uh, quite successful, quite well known. One is called The Agonistics, Thinking the World Politically uh, and the newest one, at least the one, the newest one translated into German, is in English called "For a Left Populism." I would uh, first like to not not just wait a minute, give the floor to Chantal Mouffe, and then for about 10-15 minutes, an introductory speech, and then to the young man to my right, who who is uh, who is Nicolas Koval who studied uh, economics uh, in Vienna as, and uh, part of his, his master study was supported by, um, what is it called, you said, you told me, it was called the uh, uh, Macronomic Policy Institute in Düsseldorf, which is as well as some years ago. Uh, then he was for a number of years uh, lived in Berlin as a deputy professor of economics, macroeconomics in Berlin. And uh, since uh, recent uh, weeks, he is a professor, endowment professor, Stiftungsprofessur in, in Vienna. Welcome back to Vienna from, from far away. I, I just came back from Berlin for a short visit. I was there as a consul general. I love Berlin. 
um, in spite of everything. Anyway, for, for a couple of years he was also uh, well known in the political scene on the left in Austria because he was the speaker of the so-called Sektion 8 um, in the ninth district. That, that's until about uh, five years ago. So he will be the second speaker and after the two introductory uh, sp uh, speeches, questions can be asked also in German if you prefer, also in French if you prefer, and um, Spanish to Russian maybe. Um, and uh, okay, I give the floor to uh, first uh, a hand to uh, welcome Chantal Move and Nikolaus Kova. Welcome. <laughs> and uh, now the, the floor is to Chantal Move. Thank you, Gabi. It's a pleasure to be here and also I mean, to celebrate the anniversary of uh, International, but also the, uh, a bit belated, but the anniversary of Egon, who was a very uh, great friend of mine. It's thanks to Egon that we've uh, met each other, and uh, I think that it is really an important present. It's really, we miss him terribly because it will be, his voice will be very important uh, to today with uh, the crisis of the, the, the left. In fact, I'm going to speak, the, the crisis of the left today, I mean, we should really understand it in terms of a crisis of social democracy, you know, because um, except for a few exceptions recently, uh, social democratic parties have been really doing, you know, horribly in election and they are, in fact, unfortunately, I think, uh, in the situation which is not going to be very easy for them to come out. But um, we are going to speak about that later. But I want to, in fact, we speak of the crisis of social democracy, but it's not the first time that social democracy is in crisis. Because in 1985, with uh, uh, my uh, late husband, Ernesto Laclau, we published a book called Hegemony and Socialist Strategy. There was a radical democratic politics, and it was precisely already analyzing the crisis of social democracy. Uh, but of course, the conjuncture was very, very different. And what I want to do is to, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the conjuncture of the uh, hegemony, because I think that we have a lot to learn from uh, uh, the mistake done by social democracy in that period in order not to repeat them in this uh, present circumstances. So, um, in fact, the, the crisis of social democracy, the, 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 the first one, let's call is in fact a, the, a crisis of a certain, what I think we can speak of an hegemony of social democracy, because in the post-war periods, uh, particularly with uh, the period which was really implementation of the post-war Canadian welfare state, I mean, this, I think, I, I refer to it with a period in which social democratic model was the model what it was hegemonic. Of course, uh, um, it was not only put into practice by social democratic parties, Christian Democrats in many countries also accepted, but, the, but basically I think that, and this is very different from what happened in the second period, we had some kind of consensus between the social democrats and in many countries, social uh, uh, Christian Democrats, so the fact that you know the welfare state was an agreement on, on, on that. Uh, well, this, of course, uh, lasted for probably about 30 years, and it was a period in which there was a real compromise between capital and labor. Usually one refers to social democracy as a, 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 a co Compromise. And it, uh, it, in fact, there is a book in French uh, by the Social Democracy or the Compromise. Uh, and um, it was, of course, something in which period in which some kind of compatibility was established between capitalism and democracy. I think it's important to realize that because I think that today we are not anymore in such circumstances. Uh, I think that one needs to acknowledge, uh, of course, I must confess that when I wrote Hegemony Socialist Strategy with Ernest Lowe, we were very critical of social democracy uh, because we thought that it was not radical enough. I think, and, and I think there were many people on the left that were very critical of social democracy, but today, after uh, neoliberalism, we, I think, are in a position to appreciate 
much better what social democrats had brought you know to uh, european politics because of course it was you know not, not uh, anti fundamentally anti-capitalist uh, po politics but uh, well, at least they wanted to restrain uh, the excesses of capitalism, and they managed to uh, make important advances for the working class, uh, advances uh, in social rights, and of course, I think the idea of the welfare state, now that we've seen it put into question by neoliberal, we really value it much better. That. Well, what's interesting and what I want to focus on is what, what happened? And that, that's the moment when we brought hegemony, you know, to try to the crisis. It was in the 70s, the end of the 70s. Uh, this model was, you know, came to a crisis for two reasons, I would say, two main reasons. First, of course, there was economic reason. I mean, for instance, uh, well, obviously, the, the old crisis of the 72, 73 was very important. Uh, there was the, the period of growth that had been uh, important just after the, the Second World War uh, came to an end. Well, by the way, it, it's important, of course, here to realize that this period of uh, social democracy was, of course, to be located in a specific uh, historical context. You know, it was, of course, uh, this, this compromise, let's say, between capitalism and, and uh, uh, democracy which need to be understood in the context of uh, the fact that during the war, the working class you know, contributed a lot to the effort, and so they felt that they needed to be rewarded. There was some uh, general, uh, and of course here I'm thinking particularly of the case of Britain, but some agreement that some rights were to be given to the working class, and of course, very important too, that was the moment of the, uh, uh, um, you know, the development of communism, the uh, uh, bipolar world, and there was an, a, a real fear on the part of the capitalists to see, you know, th that the communist model would become attractive to uh, the West. So they, they felt that they needed to do something in order to keep the working class. Well, that came to an end uh, in the 70s because, as I was saying, there was economic reason, the crisis of the old crisis, but also. Uh, I think that there are some political reasons which are particularly important in my view to, uh, to understand. Because, uh, in fact, during the time of uh, the Canadian welfare state, so, uh, the workers were able to defend the right, the, the unions were important, they, the, they won uh, a real power. When came the crisis, of the economic crisis, then, of course, the capitalists felt that the relation of power could not uh, be kept like that because there, there was a moment in which they would not be able to uh, maintain those uh, a, a positive aspects, you know, and they needed to reverse the, the, the balance. Also, some kind of thing which is important is the development of series of new movements, uh, remember, for instance, in 68, uh, of new demand, well, and I think it's interesting to uh, uh, remember, there was some kind of, I mean, maybe it's exaggerated, but um, some kind of panic on the side of the capitalists thinking that, mm, that that really can become very subversive. And, for instance, uh, the Trilateral Commission uh, came to the conclusion that they were speaking of an excess of democracy that put, was putting, you know, the, in the societies in in in, in a difficult position. They were also, they, I remember Huntington, for instance, in, in this report, said that uh, egalitarianism has put societies at the border. No, no, this has put societies at the border of the egalitarian pre, uh, 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 precipice. So they felt that they had to really have a reaction, and of course, this is what going to. Uh, give birth to the second period, which is the period of neoliberalism. You know, the reaction uh, uh, is to the, the crisis, both political and economic, what the development of neoliberalism. Here I'm going to concentrate basically on what happened in Britain, because I think that, of course, uh, Reagan in the, U in the US also was uh, developing this kind of neoliberal offensive. But I think that the case of Britain is quite interesting, particularly for the lesson that we can learn from that. 
because Margaret Thatcher, she at that moment intervened in order to uh, establish a, a political frontier. She broke the consensus that it, uh, uh, existed between the, the Social Democrats and uh, the Tory, but they were speaking of Buskelis, Buskelis being a term putting together, you know, two uh, leaders from the uh, um, Social Democrats, from the Labour, and from the, uh, the, the Tory. She put an end to that. She said, no, we need to establish a, a, a frontier. Uh, and the, she defined it, no, for instance, uh, clearly, the state was put as the enemy, the unions as the enemy, and th this is something that she managed to establish through an hegemonic move. I think that this is what the uh, social, the, the labor did not understand, because I remember I was in Britain at that time, and when uh, Margaret Thatcher came to power, the labor was saying, oh, you know, it's not going to last because the unemployment is going to uh, uh, grow and when the employment will have uh, reached one uh, million, then there will be a reaction of the working class. Well, Margaret Thatcher, during that time, was very cleverly creating a new hegemony. For instance, uh, she was able, and of course, this is why I think it's important to realize the shortcoming of social democracy. This model of the uh, welfare state was implemented in Britain in a very statist, uh, a bureaucratic way, which created a situation in which even people who were you know, profiting from that felt oppressed. Because, for instance, they had to uh, go to get the unemployment benefit, but they had to queue, and there was a lot of bureaucratic things. So Margaret Thatcher very cleverly came and said, I'm going to bring you freedom. You know, I'm going to bring you freedom from the state. Uh, uh, and that worked. That worked. This is how she was able to win certain, you know, sector of the population who, in fact, were not uh, predisposed to be uh, on, on her side. And, of course, there was also a very interesting uh, move, for instance, criticizing the feminists, criticizing the immigrants. She will go and speak with uh, uh, sector of the working class say, yes, I understand your problem, but you know it's the feminists who are responsible because though they want to uh, enter the, 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 you know, also uh, the market for work and, and to uh, get job or the immigrants. So she was able to consolidate an hegemony. And I think that one of the failures of the social democrats was not to have understood that and to expect you know, that the, the economic uh, crisis and the economic situation was going to bring them back uh, to power. So after I go, I'm going quickly about the year of neoliberal hegemony. Uh, what uh, 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 an aspect that I want to uh, stress is that during that time there was a transformation of social democracy who finally capitulated to neoliberalism, accepted the idea that there was no alternative to neoliberal globalization, and of course Tony Blair in that case is the paradigm of, of that, you know, the development of the third way, there is no more, uh, after that we had in Germany uh, Schroeder and, and uh, uh, um, also this Norge Mitte, so there was a profound transformation of the uh, social democracy which and before, it had at least some uh, uh, more anti-capitalist dimension, even if it was not a very strong one, but completely abandoned that. And of course, this model of the third way became you know, the dominant in the rest of Europe after the year. So, but today, we are in a very different conjuncture. Uh, different, but in a sense, they are point of similarity, because I think that we are witnessing a crisis of this neoliberal hegemony. Uh, so in the same way as we had, you know, in the 70s, uh, crisis of the social democratic hegemony, or the welfare state, after 30 years in which the, the hegemony of neoliberalism was almost not really contested, now the situation is, is very different. So it offers some opportunity to intervene, to do, in fact, uh, but in a completely different way, what Margaret Thatcher uh, did. In fact, in my book, For a Left Populism, I've got a chapter called Learning from Thatcherism. Because I think that it's very important to realize that some kind of rupture needs to be established with 
the post-political consensus, which has been the consequence of 30 years of neoliberal hegemony. Because I think that one of the consequences of those years is that we are today in a situation which can be qualified of post-democratic. Society is cool, themselves democratic, but they are really not democratic because it is something which uh, the main <coughs> central values of democracy, which are uh, equality and popular sovereignty, have been ab abandoned. And in fact, they are, uh, in, in my work, I've been trying to, but also an anterior work, for instance, like uh, uh, on the political, showing the development of what I call post politics. Post politics is, of course, expression of this. Uh, consensus at the center, the fact that when between center right and center left, there's no fundamental difference because they believe that there is no alternative to neoliberal globalization. So this post politic is one of the aspects of uh, what I, uh, is referred to as post democracy. But there is also a second aspect, and this is in fact something which is uh, uh, been particularly you know, clear uh, with the crisis of 2008 and its consequences, the way in which it was you know, led to political posterity, the fact that today we are witnessing what I call an oligarchization of our societies. And that is a very big difference with the situation that existed during uh, the hegemony of social democracy. Because of course, when there were inequalities, but nothing to do with the obscene inequalities which exist in our, in our society. Because we are now witnessing a situation in which we've got an incredible gap between a smaller and smaller group of very rich and you know, a proletarian, a, a, a pauperization, precarization of the, of the middle class, and of course, popular sector having still a very uh, even more difficult situation. So what is happening today with uh, the, this new conjuncture is that, and that is something happening in, you know, maybe we can put in 2011 as the beginning of, of that, the movement of, of the, the square in the countries, the uh, indignados in Spain, uh, Occupy Wall Street, uh, series of movement that are expression of resistances against this post-democracy. Resistance is one thing to know. For instance, one of the um, lemma of the indignados was, we have a vote, but we don't have a voice. And of course, you know, if you go to uh, vote, but you've got a choice between center right and center left, which I, I, in fact, with my student, I used to joke that it's been the difference in between Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola when you go to vote. So uh, they do have a vote, but you don't have a voice. So I think that clearly there are, there are a struggle against, um, I'm going to, to yeah, I'm going to, uh, uh, so we, we are really at a moment in which there is an expression of resistance. It's of course, the question is that those resistances against post democracy they can be articulated in many different ways. You know, they can be articulated in a way which is going to restrict democracy to be to more authoritarian, and this is of course what right-wing populism is doing, or we can also have those demands which are articulated into a um, progressive direction, problem, more equality, uh, the possibility of a recuperation and radicalization of democracy. And this is, of course, why I, my, my argument in the book is that basically, the, if we want to give a progressive issue to this crisis of neoliberalism, it's very important to develop what I call a left populism. And in, in fact, you know, if you want in the discussion, I can explain more what I understand by that. I just want to finish by uh, saying we are, in fact, and I think it's interesting to realize that in a situation which is analogous in some sense to what Karl Polanyi in the Great Transformation uh, analyzed. Because Polanyi, and he speak of a double movement, he said that there is first a movement of marketization, of course he speak of the 13, but then suddenly the society react, protect itself, but, and this is what I think is really interesting, Polanyi said this Protect, movement of protection can be either of a regressive or a progressive type. And of course, it should regressive type is the development of fascism and uh, Nazism. But 
it is also the possibility of a progressive uh, uh, way to articulate this reaction, and of course, this is the New Deal and Franklin Roosevelt. Well, I think that today the situation is very similar in that sense. You know, that the, those reactions you know, are, can be articulated either to the right or to the left, or uh, authoritarianism or uh, uh, the defense of and radicalization of democracy. So I think it's very important for the left to understand that. And what about social democratic parties? Well, social democratic parties, unfortunately, they really are not able, in general, to present an alternative because they are in great part complicit of the installation of neoliberalism. So for, for me, the two possibilities, the aside theory for uh, social democracy is either to follow the path of the PASOP in Greece, you know, obliteration, or to follow the path of Corbyn in Red Britain, because what I think is really interesting there is that we've got the uh, Social Democratic Labour Party transforming itself because adopting a left populist strategy. So I would say that if Social Democratic parties want to survive, well, they've got to follow the example of Corbyn and uh, uh, adopt a left populist strategy. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Gabi and also Fritz. Um, I want to approach the issue from two perspectives. Uh, first perspective is a more scientific and analytical one, and the other perspective is, let's say, the political animal perspective, so my personal political preferences. And the conclusions of both perspectives are not identical. So, I think we all agree that there's a general decline of the democratic left in Europe in the last 30, 40 years. And obviously, the social democracy is maybe the most prominent part of the democratic left in Europe is very strongly affected by this decline. Um, and interestingly, there is no coherent pattern regarding this decline. It is very different in uh, all the single European countries and the reactions, uh, the political reactions are also, and the conclusions are also very different. And we have seen four scenarios which are very different. And I once more want to say there is no general pattern, but we can compare the four scenarios from an analytical perspective. The first scenario where a social democratic party collapsed was the pacification of decreased social democracy during the crisis. Okay, so we remember that the um, strong and proud PASOK party, a very strong social democratic uh, party in Europe, um, totally agreed to all new liberal reforms um, from the Troika and the European Union. And then there were the elections of, I think, 2015. And in this year, the party totally uh, collapsed. It uh, gained some 6% in the elections, I think, or something, 6 or 7%. And in the same period, another party replaced the old social democracy, and that was Syriza. So Syriza with origins in the radical left, but with a, let's say, maybe somehow left wing social democratic program. Okay, so that was pacification is the replacement of a former social democratic party by a new movement. This is the Greece case, scenario number one. Scenario number two is the um, recent development in France. In France, there was no replacement by another left-wing party, but, <laughs> but there was a total uh, collapse by the old social democracy. And the most imp important or most prominent heir of the social democracy is a social liberal. And this is Emmanuel Macron with his movement en marche. But we also have, um, obviously, a radical left um, movement. But interestingly, let's say the classical democratic left in France is kind of extinct. Yeah. <laughs> it is really, maybe, it, 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 is, it is pretty dead. 
and um, there, there may be there may be roots for uh, or hope for uh, new developments in the next 20 years. But currently speaking, I would say that France is very strongly hit by the decline of the democratic left. And um, yeah, I think that uh, Emmanuel Macron um, maybe he cannot um, he cannot keep or uh, his his coalition, uh, but. I think one part of the social democratic voter, so let's say the urban, uh, the, the modern urban uh, left liberals, um, they supported uh, Macron in the last um, um, presidential elections. Okay, this is the French case. Then, as you mentioned, we have the, we have the scenario of the United Kingdom. So let's call it the back to the roots scenario. <laughs> uh, where we have a very... Um, uh, yeah, a, a, a traditional uh, democratic socialist <laughs> um, who looks like uh, a guy from the 80s um, and, and, and uh, who um, had the credibility um, to revitalize the old um, uh, Labour Party and um, supported by the Momentum Movement who orchestrated um, the, all the party fights and uh, also I think the, the last uh, campaign Labour gained 40% of total votes in the 2017 elections. Okay, so at the same time where the German social democracy was by somehow as a 20%, Labour um, um, uh, made 40%, which was really impressive. And this one scenario of um, um, development of social democratic or center-left parties in Europe. So I think UK is the third case. So back to the roots scenario. And very recently, there is a fourth scenario, which is especially interesting for us. And this is the Danish, the Danish elections. And in Denmark, something happened. The social democracy, the old traditional social Demo the democratic party of Denmark, um, changed their program, they got more to the left in social questions together with the trade unions, they went more to the right regarding immigration, and their electorate changed. They lost a lot of liberal and left-wing voters, but they won a lot of former voters of right-wing populists. And now there is a left-wing or center-left majority because in Denmark we have two, two left-wing parties so real left-wing parties the traditional one and the green one we have two left liberal parties and um, all the voters, all the left-wing voters of, uh, the, of the social democracy were absorbed by the left and, and, and green and, and left-wing liberal parties but at the same time this party could gain, I don't know, I think two thirds of the of the votes of the of the right-wing populists, and in Denmark now, this the the red bloc is a, has got about 52 okay. percent. So let's think about Austria. In Austria, the right, the the the, the, the very right um, conservative party, together with the right-wing populists, um, gained about uh, 58 percent and in the polls they are still stable at this level. So there was a very interesting movement in Denmark. And if we look at Austria and Germany, I think um, the, the, the current political um, cocktail is no longer sustainable. They will have to decide. <laughs> there are some options. <laughs> you can disappear, you can uh, go back to your roots, or you can uh, do it the Danish way. So there are different options on the table. And I'm not talking from an analytical perspectives. And not from my personal political pre preferences. If I compare Austria to my four cases, it is obviously closest to Denmark. It's a small open economy, very strong social state, strong social democratic tradition, strong trade unions, and a public opinion towards immigration which is very critical, or let's say, um, populist or racist. The Danes have the same problem. 
<coughs> so, honestly, I think that the most promising strategy for Austria would be, from a tactical perspective, to unite Mr. Doskozil with the trade unions <laughs> and, and to try to get back voters from the right and to establish a new left wing or a new left liberal party and to absorb all the, all the voters, all the urban, um, modern, um, uh, liberal voters um, with these pacts. I think this would be um, the most promising um, strategy. However, it is not my preferred one. <laughs> because it is, as I'm a member of the Austrian Social Democratic Party, it, <laughs> it, will not be, it, it is not a strategy that I, um, that I would support, personally. Um, I would prefer um, the labor strategy. Um, however, I know that the difference between UK and Austria is enormous. Uh, so if we talk about the UK, we talk about um, real poverty. We talk about real infrastructure problems. We talk about um, landscapes, devastated landscapes uh, in, in, in middle and northern England. Um, we talk about houses uh, that have not, uh, have not been renovated in the last 30 or 40 years. So. Um, there are real big poor areas, and um, well, some of the poorest areas of Western Europe are in Northern England. So London is the richest area in uh, in, in, in in Europe, and uh, parts of Northern Europe, uh, Northern England, are um, uh, the poorest areas in Western Europe. So I think um, the, the different uh, the difference in Austria is enormous. I think Austria is more like Denmark, and um, I think it will be difficult. Nevertheless. Um, also regarding the actual uh, structure of the, of the Social Democratic Party where we have both wings, we have the traditional wing with the trade unions and we also have the, the um, modern urban, uh, more liberal wing. Um, regarding, regarding the political reality and regarding my preferences, I would prefer a uh, strategy in the direction of labor, uh, which would mean let's focus on the social questions and try to replace the right-wing discourse by focusing on the social and maybe somehow um, class struggle, uh, not too much, but a little bit, on a class struggle strategy. Um, I think in the current situation, we could maybe gain 30 or 35 percent with this strategy, but um, I think it's, it will be difficult to get a majority regarding uh, the Austrian realities. Okay, so these are my analytical and my personal perspectives on recent developments in center-left parties in Europe. Yeah, to Nikki. Well, I'm, I'm exactly with uh, many of the things you say, but concerning Macron, I've got some disagreement because I think that, uh, well, we need to distinguish the Macron of the presidential election and the Macron today. Because Macron, the presidential election, uh, that, uh, 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 what are they put it? Le, le, et de droite et de gauche, you know? So, so he did not. Uh, say, uh, um, also, uh, uh, on time, on time, the same time. That, that, that was his motto. Uh, well, since then, I think that it has become very clear that it was more from the right than from the left. You know, cl clearly, uh, since the beginning, uh, all his policies, it, it, it was clearly very quickly uh, deemed the president of the rich because his first measure was to eliminate the the the. Uh, uh, Property tax. Uh, property tax, yes. Uh, yes say, uh, impose sur la fortune. Impose sur la fortune. Something that you know, basically for, for, for the rich. And in fact, all the politics of Macron since, since then have been more and more you know, moved up. In fact, uh, the consequence of that is, is uh, it's interesting to see, for instance, that in the recent uh, European election, there have been a transfer of, of vote. I mean, um, Macron is lost part of the people who voted for uh, him coming from, from the left, and those people moved to the uh, ec uh, ecological party. I mean, a part of the success of the ecology means that more you know, le left 
thinking uh, Macronite move to London. And on the contrary, a lot of people uh, from uh, the right uh, have now really moved to the Republican march, and consequence of that is the collapse of the, re the Republican with the right-wing party. And also clearly the, the, the access has been moved towards. So, I mean, I'm, I'm honestly, what I want to mean and say that I will not call that social liberalism, not even social liberalism. You know, because, uh, uh, for instance, uh, clearly, uh, th this is something that was adequate for the France a lot. But I don't think that in the case of Macron, maybe what we could uh, call it is uh, taking a, a term that has been coined for, for the U, uh, US by Nancy Fraser, progressive neoliberalism. You know, it is definitively something which is defense of neoliberalism with some progressive uh, in terms of uh, uh, what are called societal issues. You know, there is, yeah, yeah, there is a bit, but, but basically is is uh, yeah, defense of, of neoliberalism. And with respect to that, Nikki, there is a question which I would want to, to I think we need to, to raise is if, if we accept that, the, and that's you know, it's my position, but of course, you know, it's not everybody agree with that, that we are today in a moment which is, we get a crisis of neoliberalism. This is a system which is good. And here I'm, I'm basing myself uh, in part on the uh, um, analysis of uh, uh, Wolfgang Streich, you know, uh, who in, in his book, uh, Buying Times, uh, insists, and I think he's got good argument, at the, the time of the possibility of conciliating capitalism and democracy has come to an end. So we are at the moment in which we are part in company. So uh, either we are going to uh, abandon, of course, he's, he's not speaking of a completely anti-capitalist thing, but he thinks capitalism under its neoliberal form is not going to be compatible anymore for, with, with democracy. So it's going to move into a much more authoritarian direction. And by the way, that's already what, what we are seeing also in France. Because in fact, in the answer of uh, Macron to the uh, yellow vest de gilets jaunes, I mean, it has been extremely authoritarian, extremely repressive, and many of the you know, social uh, 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 rights and the, the, for instance, the right of demonstration. I mean, this regime has become much, much more uh, uh, authoritarian because, you know, it, it, there are resistances, clearly, the, the resistances of the Gilets Jaunes were resistant and did not want uh, to, to, to accept the, the uh, um, you know, policy of Macron. Macron, when he came to power, and got his, his analysis was that the problem with France is that France has not completed this neoliberal revolution. You know, so he's going to, uh, uh, and in fucking a sense, he was right, because they are still, if I compare that with, with Britain, there are many aspects of the welfare state that are still working in France. And Macron said, that's the problem. This is why we've got unemployment. You know, he wants to destroy, destroy all that. But of course, you know, the, the French society is not ready to follow that. And the, 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 the reaction of the yellow West is in fact, no, no, this model, we don't want to do that. And I think that we are in a situation which is really, there is no, no solution because Macron, of course, cannot uh, um, really accept, you know, the demand. So his way to defend is authoritarian. So I think that, uh, um, that's why I'm, I wonder about what you, the, the, the Danish model, uh, which you seem to, even if it's not your, pre, your pre, uh, preferred one, you seem to imagine that could be a solution. Um, for the Austrian that, case. For the Austrian case, yes. But, but do you think that it could, I mean, it, it, the question is that, is that could that provide a, 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 a issue to the crisis of neoliberalism? That's my question, you know? Or is it a way to delay, uh, 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 um, to buy time, as uh, uh, Strike said, to buy time, to delay it, you know? That, that's a question that I think it will be okay. interesting. I think the important, for the Austrian case, the important point is we, we have to, there is also the crisis of neoliberalism. However, Austria is maybe one of the lowest hit countries by neoliberalism in the world. It's important to know, you know that collective bargaining is some 97% coverage, 
you know that uh, we have the um, public option in the uh, in the um, insurance system and the healthcare system. Uh, we have high tax rates, so um, the the whole welfare system of the 20th century is still working in Austria. So besides our specific neoliberal crisis, we've got this cultural fight, and this cultural fight is maybe stronger than in other countries. I've been living in Germany for four years, and I mean the Germans, they still know <laughs> what is, I mean, the general society, what is fake news, what is no fake news, huh? and who is reasonable and who is totally crazy. Okay? In Austria, um, and the borders between crazy and reasonable, between fake news and no fake news, between um, um, Total uh, uh, boulevard media and, uh, and, 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 and reasonable media, the, the borders are vanishing totally, and we have the strongest right wing bloc in Western Europe. It's, it's, close, to, it's close to Orban. It's about nearly 60% support this kind of policy. So, um, in the specific Austrian case, I think that the cultural, um, the cultural fight. To, um, to, restain to, 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 to restore sanity, okay, uh, um, is, uh, is, is, is very important. And in this case, for this case, I think that um, every loss of the right-wing populists or the conservative party, but I think the right-wing populists are more vulnerable, every loss of, of, of uh, every percent to lose is a win for civilization in this country. And therefore, um, I, I tend to say that the Danish strategy may not be very elegant and, uh, and may not solve, the, uh, may not be a, a sustainable solution concerning the new liberal crisis, but it may be a possibility to breathe again in a country with one of the strongest um, uh, right wing or conser right conservative uh, genuines in, uh, in Western Europe. Two questions of clarification. Uh, would you agree, because it's, it's just happened to me, it is in fact Kurz trying to do what Macron is, is doing in, in, in France, that is uh, to, to push really, uh, to destroy what remains of the welfare state in order to push a neoliberal agenda? First question. The second one is that, uh, um, well, which is linked? Okay, the, 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 if, if is the case, is it possible, uh, do, do you envisage that because the, 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 the way to resist against that would be the, the, Dani the, the Danish way, would that be a way in which they can uh, also could, you know, resist uh, this uh, offensive, of course? So, second, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a new case, but it seems the most plausible option regarding the Austrian reality to me now. Um, first, first question, um, trade unions and um, left social democrats say that Mr. Kurz is destroying um, the traditional Austrian welfare state. Okay? I think it is important to say it, but I don't believe it's true. Uh -huh. I think Mr. Kurz has no program. He has not said anything about the, pensions, uh, the pension uh, system in Austria, which is very generous. They are not attacking it. Okay? They, made some, they, they enlarged the working hours, but they are not really at attacking the collective bargaining system. So they are doing, they are doing some favors to their rich sponsors, but they are not attacking the core model of the, um, of the Austrian welfare state. So my, my analysis is that um, Mr. Kurz is um, he's maybe you know, one step further than Macron. He's, he, that's why he's close to Orban. You know, he has got some, um, he's got a right-wing agenda in cultural questions, but he, uh, until now it was not a radical, uh, liberal um, agenda destroying the Austrian welfare state. Thank you so far. Um, let us also take questions from, from you, from, from the audience, so to speak. Um, we'll take two or three and then, and please um, say to whom you're addressing your questions, if possible. Yeah? Is it 
Stefanie. All right, uh, so thank you very much. I'm also going to introduce me shortly. My name is Stefanie Fenkert and I'm the, the director here of this institute. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy that we could have been able to host you. Um, I have actually two questions and probably also a comment. One question is to you, um, where do you see, like for example, Portugal in this model? Because Portugal does not have a right-wing populism and is not really falling into this trap. Probably also a little bit it's different, but also what about like this like Western Bloc, Portugal, Spain? Um, that was one, and then also you said about uh, how to regain this, um, the electorate of the social democrats, and in, in, I'm now referring to the Austrian case, like this left, um, liberal, left wing, uh, left uh, people, thinkers. I think that's probably also a misunderstanding because as far as I see, the, the social democracy in Austria it used to be the party of the workers, and it was even called, you know, like, um, um, Sozialdemokratische Arbeiterpartei, so it was actually, that was the electorate, and these people never have been like super open-minded or super, like, I don't know, I mean, I know there are different ones, but this was the target group, so what you are actually suggesting is that we should actually shift the target group probably to another one, like more really to the to the left, uh, left leftist parties, which are, in my opinion, definitely lacking in Austria, so that would be for you, the very leftist party. I didn't, sorry, I didn't, I didn't get the point. The, uh, about the electorate, like who are the, who is the target group of the social democracy? Because it used to be the workers and not the, the liberal-minded, um, um, yeah, yeah, these people. And the other one is, of course, um, I would very much like to know uh, what you mean with left-wing populism. What does it really mean? Because as I as I see it, populism itself is not, um, it's a tool more or less. I mean, it's not really, populism does not really have an ideology itself. It, it attaches to left wing or to right wing. And I pose this question, I already posed it to many social uh, democratic um, former leaders, like can we counteract, um, I don't know, right wing populism with left wing populism? And, and all of them actually rejected it immediately by saying they just don't want to be, to give these simplistic answers. So that would it be for me right now, thank you. Is this another one back here? Is it working? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the panel. Just uh, one uh, remark and then one question. Uh, I think uh, because what have, uh, Mr. Kohler said, that there, uh, there are hardly any attacks on the social system, well, probably not, but I think there, there are some tendencies uh, on the courts that we see some shifts. I mean, uh, I can remember he, uh, he was talking about uh, kind of an importing hard sphere to Austria. I mean, this would be a quite uh, obvious case of somehow attacking the welfare state. Just, I think this happened, even though there were not really measures taken towards this, but we have a, a tendency there, I think. And my question would be, uh, when uh, 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 Frau Ruf talked about the kind of rupture we should take in a kind of establish a, a kind of a new hegemonic line between this course, uh, how do you see the kind of, and I think this is a unique feature of Austria, that uh, there is uh, what we call social partnership in this kind of uh, uh, rupture and this kind of strategy we have to uh, uh, yeah, my name is Hannes Hochbrand, I'm a publisher. I have two questions. The one is, uh, Shantan Bufio said uh, that the social democracy was a compromise between capital and democracy, and I think that's very true. And on the other hand, you spoke about that 30, since 30 years, the social democratic a movement is declining. So what happened 30 years ago? It was the breakdown of the Soviet Union and the Comic Con. So why do, didn't you take any relation between, between this breakdown and the social democratic parties which are no longer useful for capital because there is no other system? That's my first question. And the second question is what do you think about if you speak of left populism about our southern neighbors, about the Czech Vestele? Is it a left wing party? Uh, what do you think about our Italian neighbors, uh, Cinque Stelle, Five Stars, uh, left, left populism or not? That's my question. Okay. Now, let's pause here, the three, and um, I'll give the floor. Who wants to react first? Who wants to say something? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, one question was, what is about the Portuguese case? I think the Portuguese case is closely related to the uh, UK case. Yeah? I think it's a um, back to the roots scenario, but uh, with less um, um, traditional rhetoric. 
Uh, I think what they did was to, uh, they were lucky that the economy was recovering and in the same period they just tried to, um, uh, to meet the, um, the demands of the, of the European Commission but not by cutting uh, social programs but um, by um, maybe taxing uh, the right groups or something like this. So I, th I think um, there was a classical social democratic strategy which may be closely related to back to the roots or traditional, uh, traditional strategy. So I think it's maybe closest to the UK scenario. Um, and um, then you asked me about the target groups. Um, the traditional target group, um, I mean, the traditional alliance of the, of the democratic left is workers and intellectuals, right? This is the, this is the alliance of the, of the uh, late 19th century um, establishing uh, the left uh, period. And I think in the 20th century, this was a very strong and sustainable alliance. Uh, and um, obviously, the higher quantity, uh, uh, much bigger part of this alliance were always, was always the working class. <clears throat> so, I think um, the Austrian social democracy lost a lot of uh, working class um, voters, I think even most of them. Even uh, in, in Austria, more workers do vote for Mr. Kurz uh, than for the social, Demo social democrats. And in the same period, they gained uh, more workers from the middle class and from the, from the uh, urban areas. Uh, and uh, the last election of 2017 was the most extreme uh, point of this development when um, the Green Party collapsed and Mr. Kern was able to compensate all the losses in the Obersteiermark uh, by gaining voters in central Vienna and in central Graz and so on and so on. So I think today the electorate of the, of the um, now much smaller social democracy has changed towards um, the city centers. So if you ask me who should be the traditional, who, who should be the main target group, I think it should, should still be the working class, either they are open-minded or not. And I think in the UK, in, in, in the United Kingdom, what they try is to re-establish the traditional coalition between working class and intellectuals uh, and some public sector um, groups, okay? This is the 20th century coalition. Um, what Denmark did is totally different because they also um, had a pretty much um, liberal electorate in the last elections with, um, with the last uh, social democratic prime minister and um, now they have about the same percentage like in the last elections, but a totally different electorate. Okay, they have about 26%, I think, in Denmark, but the 26% are uh, composed by totally different groups of voters. And they, lost, they won from the right-wing populists and lost um, progressive voters to the Greens and left parties. So it's exactly the opposite that Mr. Kern was doing in 2017, who lost work, uh, traditional workers to the right-wing uh, right populists and uh, gained progressive workers. So if you ask me um, uh, who should be the main target group, I think it should still be the, uh, the working class and I think you need a strategy where they are totally included. Uh, and I think the, the urban elites uh, uh, should not be the main target group because they w will not vote right-wing anyway. They may vote liberal or green or, or, or whatever, but they are not going to vote um, right-wing populism or um, conservatives like Kurz. So, and um, the question um, regarding hard sphere and uh, how, um, how dangerous is the Kurz government regarding uh, our social system? I think it's difficult to say because they were only in power for one and a half year. But I had a discussion last week with Mr. Frank Schellhorn, yeah, who is president of the uh, uh, right liberal think tank Agenda Austria. Okay? And Mr. Singh, Mr. Shadhorn is very, very disappointed. Okay? Because he and the other liberals were hoping that replacing the social democrats, the democrats in the government by 
the uh, right-wing populists would open corridors for establishing more market elements in the Austrian system. And obviously there have been some discussions. I, think, I, I don't think that Mr. Kurz is happy with the hard sphere discussion. He's too smart for things like this. Um, there have been some, there have been some um, neoliberal um, changes, but um, I think the right, the right liberals, um, they are really disappointed because the, 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 the big, um, the, 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 the big attack um, has not occurred until now. Okay, okay. Well, basically, I mean, the, the main question here is, is to, of course, uh, I, I told you in my paper I can answer the question of left populism because I did not want to have a too long uh, presentation. Okay, let's clarify. I think it's very important because, of course, populism is something that you know it enters it in so many different ways. First, I, I, uh, I want to clarify that uh, in my reflection on. on but left populism, I'm basically drawing on the definition of populism that Ernesto Laclau gave in his book on, popul on populist reason. So where he say uh, left uh, well, populism, and after we'll see, we'll see about uh, what left populism. Populism is not an ideology. It's not a regime. It's just a strategy of construction of the political frontier. You know, to have, because here, of course, it already indicates that populism, you can only understand populism if you locate yourself in what uh, one can call it a, 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 a dissociative conception of the political. Because when one thinks, what is the political? There are basically two answers to that. One is called the associative conception. I think politics is uh, the, you know, acting together, uh, the field of uh, liberty, the field basically the question centrally to establish consensus. That, that's the conception which is dominant in most liberal democratic theory. Then there is another conception which is called dissociative conception that you find in Tuchelides, in Machiavelli, in Hobbes, in uh, um, Weber, uh, Claude Lefort in France, which say no, politics is about conflict. If there is politics, it's because they are antagonic and there is conflict. So society is divided. So it means that politics is necessarily partisan. It's not the idea that we can establish you know, a consensus without exclusion is simply off the mark. It's partisan and it always consists of distinction, construction of us, and that requires the determination of a death. All right. But the way this us death is constructed, can be constructed in different ways. Of, of course, by the way, this is a distinction which most uh, liberal do not accept. Liberal think from an uh, associative conception. You know, there is no, uh, uh, basically, with that for it's untypical of the third way. Blair was, uh, was saying, uh, we are all no middle class, so they are more antagonists, we can all agree. And of course, this was the idea of uh, Tom Negidon, the historian beyond left and right, also the idea that we find a big bank, you know, finally, there's no, we can all uh, agree. Well, the, of course, this is supposed, and from that point of view, of course, you can only see populism as a, as a, a pathology of democracy. I know, why are we going to divide people between uh, uh, us and them if, if basically the aim is to establish consensus? Well, I'm saying politics is necessarily about uh, us, us and them. And the, so this is what I call a political frontier. But it can be constructed in different ways. Mainly there are two ways to construct a political frontier. There is the Marxist way of constructing a political frontier because contrary to the liberal, Marxists do construct a frontier, but it's between the, the, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, capital and labor. A populist construction of the political frontier is different because it's a construction of the frontier on the basis of the people from below and the people from above. The people uh, versus the establishment. Well, so that is what is populism. And of course, Laclau insists, and I agree very much with him, it does not have a specific uh, uh, programmatic content. You know, it can be many different, uh, constructed in many different ways. And it also is compatible with many different types of institutions. For instance, at my point, if left with populism, I say that it is definitely compatible with pluralist institution. 
Because there are many people who say, no, no, populism is necessarily anti-democratic. You know, this, this is that, of course, I do not accept. Okay, so construction of the political frontier between you know, the, the us and the them. People from above, people from uh, 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 below. Of course, that can be constructed in many different ways, because here I want to insist when I speak of the people, the people is not a sociological category. It's not an empirical referent. You know, it, it is a discursive construction. Uh, it, it's, a, a, it's a political category. The people can be constructed in many different ways. And this is where the difference between right-wing populism and left populism is. Because, for instance, well, take, take two examples, concrete examples, uh, right-wing populism Marine Le Pen, left populism Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Well, Marine Le Pen construct the, the, the people in a way which is basically, you know, ethno-nationalist. Uh, the people are uh, the good native uh, French, and of course the immigrants are not part of the people. You know, they, but it's, it's already a, a, a political construction. While for uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the uh, immigrants are part of the people. So you see what can, the people is not something that these days is very different from the population, not something that many people don't understand. It's not an empirical reference, it's always constructed in a different way. And of course, the people always, since politics is partisan, need to have an adversary, the them, the them. But of course, the them can be constructed in many different ways. For instance, for left populism, the them is constructed as the forces of neoliberalism, you know, pension fund, and all the people who, all, all this, it's a, it's a structure, of course, represented by people, it's basically a structure. Well, for uh, Marine Le Pen, of course, the, 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 the them is the immigrant, and the, the, the forces of the establishment who impose you know, immigrants on, on the, the French people. So I think what is important here is, is to realize that what's the stake? is how you are going to construct the people. <coughs> and construct the people, it's important today in the crisis of neoliberal hegemony, because this crisis is manifested by the multiplication of resistances against a post-democracy. And I think that it's important to see all those, those movements that are called anti-system, is people in the Gilets Jaunes in France, you know, are fighting against post-democracy. They want to have a voice, and they also fight against the idea of inequality. But uh, um, it, it is very important to see who you are going to put into the people. And here, for instance, I think that uh, uh, the example that uh, Nikki was giving about, obviously, uh, for the, the way in which in, in Denmark, you know, of course, it, it, it's not a, a populist uh, uh, things that they differ, but they, they, they construct the, the us, you know, in a way in, 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 in which, which is very different, for instance, in the way in which the us is constructed by uh, Corbyn. And by the way, the, uh, the Corbyn movement, they do, uh, uh, um, I have the impression that Nikki doesn't want to take a uh, position in favor of left populism, but by saying that this is the model that you favor, basically you are saying that, you know, because uh, the model that you favor is, is a left populism. Because the people around Corbyn do accept that they are defending a left populist strategy. And in fact, for instance, they, it was very interesting to see that what is specific of Corbyn and is that there is a break with uh, uh, Blair, there is a br break with you know, the consensus of the center, you know, they want to establish a frontier, and in fact they did it, for instance, in the, the um, election, the manifesto, was for the many, not the few. It's interesting is it, to see that uh, th this uh, 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 so was accepted without any problem by the uh, right in, the, in the, the, the party, because it's a slogan that was already used by Blair before, but it was for the many, not the few, for all, all inclusive. And in fact, the, 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 the people of Corbyn uh, resignify this in terms of a frontier for the many, not the few. You know, so there is it's an us and a them, which was eliminated from the discourse of uh, of Blair. So I think that what is at stake really here is 
how you are going to construct the us and the them. And the strategy of left populism that I defend is a construction of us that is the articulation or in, in, uh, we, we, there is a term that we use in a hegemonic socialist strategy, the creation of a chain of equivalence among a multiplicity of democratic struggles. So in this case, it is a question of recognizing the democratic demands, of course, of the working class, but also of you know the, 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 mid, the middle class, the, the, the uh, and and it's very important, a question of the amount around feminism, anti-racism, and obviously today the question of the ecology. You know, so it's an articulating the demand, establishing a collective will whose project is in fact to uh, uh, recover democracy, but I think that it's clear that neoliberalism really has you know, reduced democracy to, to nothing. Uh, this is what I speak of post-democracy. So it needs to be recovered, but it needs to be recovered to be radicalized, to be extended. Because in the case of Marine Le Pen and right-wing populism, they also want to recover democracy. I mean, they all say, we are going to give a voice to the people, you know, the, all of them. But of course, they want to uh, recover democracy in order to restrict it. You know, to, to really, for instance, Marine Le Pen is very much in favor of uh, uh, the, the, the welfare state and all that, but only for the for the the, the, the not, not, not national, you know. She all said that in fact in, in her discourse there are a lot of measures that come, you know, even more for instance radical in a sense than what um uh, but but all that but only for the French, the, the native native French. Huh? So I think that that's quite inter important to, to, to see how you are, uh, are articulating uh, that, that, that the demand are articulated in there. And in the case of left populism, I think that it's very important to realize that there are a multiplicity of fight against uh, uh, democracy, a multiplicity of what I call democratic demands coming from many different, and that the aim of uh, uh, left populist uh, strategy is to articulate all those demands, to create a collective will. This is what I call the people, you know. Uh, uh, so, well, one, uh, uh, well, ah, she, she quest LA. Well, she quest LA, it's, a, I will call it a proto-populist movement, because um, 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 it, it is really something that is not defined, uh, neither in terms of uh, right nor in terms of, of, of left. And it is, it's, and this, of course, is, is a problem, no, that they are that, that f f facing the fact that uh, by their alliance with, they pre pretended to not to be neither right nor left, but with the alliance with uh, uh, Salvini, so they are basically are subordinated to a uh, right-wing uh, uh, strategy. And in fact, there are many, I mean, I've, I've got many, many friends in, in Italy that imagine that it's going to be a break in, in Cinque Stelle. That definitively, you know, the people who are there thinking with more left, pop, left uh, 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 sensibility are, are going to leave. So the, you, you can't maintain uh, the, this kind of uh, uh, thing, you know, not, not left, uh, no, no right. So I, and the last question, I mean, I'm not quite sure. What, when you speak social partnership, I mean, uh, the, are you speaking only of social partnership or is that in, for me? It makes sense in, in, in the context of a of, of, uh, uh, grand coalition, you know? No, no, no. no not, not only? Much more than that. Uh, well, no, 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 no not, not more. I'm, I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I think that can you have a social partnership uh, under uh, the hegemony of a party, I mean, I mean, it, it's, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's it, of course, I, I don't know enough about the, the case, but, but basically what I can, I'm, I'm not against, I, I, I really uh, should not be able to answer that. What I can say, which clearly I, I, that I know is that I'm against grand coalition, because I think precisely this is a way in which there is what typical of post-politics, you know, because people then do, do not, do not have a choice. I think, for instance, one of the, in my view, one of the big, big, big mistake of the SPD in Germany has been to be involved with so many grand coalitions and, and they've joined again, you know, because then uh, uh, 
people don't, don't feel that they can identify with, with, with the project. So I, I think that grand coalition are definitively not something which is uh, um, good for democracy because it is, and of course that if I introduce another term of my work, it's for me, democracy needs to be agonistic. That we need to offer real alternative. You know, they need to, and of course, but by definition, a grand coalition is not agonistic. It is something that we are all going to, to, to agree. So I am uh, definitively, clearly, not against uh, uh, against grand coalition, uh, and I'm not quite sure here uh, about the. Um, is it possible to have social partnership independently? Uh, so that that will be a question which I would need to know more about. Okay. One, uh, two remarks on uh, Chantal. Um, I, I agree with uh, nearly all what you're saying, and I think um, the point is that um, we need more conflict in our democracy. Okay? So obviously the conflicts are there, and in the, new li in the liberal view, uh, in the, in the liberal view in the world, um, obviously we are all individuals and can decide um, when we go, for, when we vote for a party, we decide like we will be in a supermarket and uh, decide between yogurt number one or yogurt number two, okay? So obviously we need, uh, uh, we need uh, re-establishing uh, the thinking in, in, in collectives, uh, we need conflict, we need all this. In, in the case of the Sozial um, uh, we in the section after we once called it, we don't want to abolish the Sozial but we want, we, what we want is a democratic class struggle. Uh, so, to also uh, politicize social partnership and um, to, to, to be more confrontative um, in this um, field. Um, and I'm also totally against uh, the, great, the great, uh, great Coalition, because the Great Coalition is um, destroying conflict by definition. So obviously, um, the appearance of right, the early appearance of right-wing populism in Austria is closely related to the tradition of the Great Coalition in Austria. Okay. So, um, and um, there is, um, I think it's easy to see all social democratic parties now um, try to focus on Zusammenhalt, okay? Which is, yeah, yeah. You, you understand, right? So, Gesellschaftlicher Zusammenhalt. This is one of the main ideas of the social democracy and many progressives in the cities think exactly that's what we want because Zusammenhalt is the opposite of racism against immigration. But what the social democrats don't understand is that Zusammenhalt is the problem and not the solution. Because when they say Zusammenhalt, they say we want to, um, we want to save the old neoliberal world where everyone, everybody was happy with the position uh, he had. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want to have new conflicts in society, to replace the racist conflict and the right-wing conflict, you have to abolish to summon height. Mm -hmm. And you have to talk about conflict. And to talk about uh, populism. And, if, and uh, I mean, the old distinction between labor and capital is, it's a, it's a populist concept. Mm -hmm. So the, the core of the old left where you distinguish between two groups yeah, is kind of a populist concept. And, um, and I, I, I totally think we need these distinctions, we need this populism, we need this polarization, and we need this politicization of politics to, um, yeah, to wipe out all the, all the right-wing um, destruction of the society. So this is the most sustainable strategy. I totally agree with this, okay? Okay. Thank you, Tommy. First, Thomas, and then... Mm -hmm. Thomas um, Thank you. Um, I, I just uh, into a kind of remark. I, I'm not that certain that populism is an empty vessel that can be filled either with progressive or with reactionary. He's, it's the, uh, populism is anti-elitist, it's anti-rational, it's inherently hostile, it's in search of an enemy. And uh, if history is any guide, it usually ends very badly. I mean, this is the, but uh, uh, may I, may I uh, return to the issue of the, of, of the, of the democratic left? Uh, it is not so that uh, if you ask the question, how was it possible when you said that 
Thatcher came and she imposed another uh, the slogan and other uh, discourse upon society. Well, there are two sides. There's Mrs. Thatcher and there's the society. How come this is possible to impose such a thing? What is, what is happening on the, society, on the side of society? And what has happened is that uh, uh, the society has lost the sense of solidarity and has lost uh, the capacity for collective action. I think it's basically a pro forward-looking progressive action. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, that, that I'm the, also Nikki, I'm not completely in the conservative The Zusammenhalt is something very basic. It's a base also for, for political action on the left. That you are feel capable that, that there are others like you and, 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 and that, 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 that there is something a common good that extends beyond the ranks of the party, which is the best for Austria and so on. So, so the sense of, 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 of a solidarity is there. So this is, uh, the, this is the, what the left parties have to cope with, is the sense of, of loss of sol so solid solidarity. And with what kind of, we actually, we always have a guilty person, like, you know, kind of, uh, raise the personal conjunction even at the expense of, of, of common action in fields where it would be necessary, okay, infrastructure and so on. And the second sense is that the left party can, uh, can only, if there is a goal, if we can define a goal that can be understood by the person. So my big, uh, looking back at, for instance, the party program of uh, 89, which was the success of the a very bad successor to the program that Egon Martin wrote. You know, but uh, so so basically, we promised this Chancengleichheit. Everybody can go ahead. Everybody can, can be better than his is. You know, everybody can keep ahead in this race. The race, the competitive race, which destroys solidarity, has not been put into question at all in the thing. So, so to, 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 two things are first of all. Well, uh, the question of solidarity is essential, and uh, uh, it, 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 right, of course it can have very ugly aspects as a kind of uh, mistrust against foreigners, but basically the feeling that you're, you're, you're a community and you're striving for a common good. And second is that you have a vision that can be under, understood, and I think on both sides the social democracy has been highly defective. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'd probably start first with a question. Um, it's interesting that more and more left-wing authors are now writing about, uh, for example, Thomas Fasi and Robert Mitchell regaining the state. They say we have to go back to the nation, to national sovereignty because this is the only possibility to uh, to maintain democracy. So this was, would be, uh, there are many left-wing authors who, who say the same now. That's quite interesting. Uh, because I used to be on the Habermas motion before, but now it's uh, the other way around. Um, and I, probably I want to say something about um, the social democracy and the left-wing <coughs> parties. I think the best analysis uh, I read was from Didier Eribon, Retour à Reims. Uh, this book really showed us very, very, very well why his parents, for example, he comes from a poor working class, uh, and why his parents who voted before the Communist Party, they changed to uh, the father Le Pen. And the problem, I just, Put it, I say it in one sentence. The problem was really that what you said, Chantal, everybody went to the middle. It was kind of uh, this, um, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the 80s, the Dritte the, 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 the Weg, uh, and um, it, it, it was neither left nor, nor right. But the problem was also that the working class people, nobody mirrored their situation anymore. Nobody talked about their situation, what they are, what they have to in their working places, what their 
what they wanted, uh, what they were missing, and, and what the situation was, etc. Nobody talked about this anymore. Everybody spoke about the middle, middle class. Yeah? And, and then, uh, then the Social Democrats also uh, were, um, with the neoliberals also made new, when they were in power, they made also neoliberal policy. And then also they, um, the left wing people, also the Social Democrats, also what you said about Nancy Fraser, the progressive neoliberalism, they also talked about the values, uh, changing values and so on, but nobody, what Nikki Kovac said, uh, nobody talked about uh, the working class anymore and the, the problems of the working class anymore, the exploitation and so on. Yeah? And uh, so I don't know any left-wing party who, who does this. So, so we have to go back to the roots, what you said to Polanyi. And, and I think really the, the difference between right and left is that you have either more market uh, and less state, or you have more state and less market. Yeah? That, you, that the common goods are important because also the poor people have access to them, but not if you privatize everything and you can't afford, like in Berlin and Paris and other in London, and so you can't afford to rent anymore. Yeah? Thank you. A missing in our discussion one dimension, political dimension, that's internationalism. If you look to my party, SPD, there is uh, nothing. We have no international secretariat since a couple of years. We are thinking just in very narrow national dimensions. <coughs> On the other hand, the working class, let's say the European working class, is confronted with a capitalism, a global capitalism, a global high organized capitalism, do you think we can struggle them with national, with narrow national goals? What is your opinion? Okay, but now it's three, and there were some questions to both of you. Would you like to start? No, 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 no. Okay, uh, Tommy, to your question. I um, totally agree. I totally agree that the competitive race in society is um, destroying all the old basics of social democracy and solidarity. And it is funny that um, the Social Democrats were one of the strongest supporters um, of this policy of um, equality of opportunities. I mean, <clears throat> that's a historic development. You know, the, the old, what, what did the old Social Democrats say 100 years ago? 100 years ago they said, you are a worker, you will die as a worker, but you can improve your situation and you can be proud because you are working and all the others are not. So, you are producing this society and you can be, you can be proud of this. And you are, you are important and we will improve your situation socially and culturally and everything. So, but this was, this, was the, this was the old thinking, let's say, until, the second, uh, until World War II. In the, in, the, in, the, in the most successful period of social democracy, there was a coalition of the old workers, or the old worker focus, combined with equality of opportunities um, in the Kreisky, Brandt, Palme period, and social mobility. So, how was it possible for Kreisky to gain an uh, absolute majority? All the workers still voted social democracy, and part of the middle class who wanted social mobility. And 
in the last 30, 40 years, the focus on social mobility got always stronger, and the focus on the old working class lost um, focus and priority. And this is close to what Eva asked. Um, I think there, is, there are many sociological reasons uh, that we should consider regarding the question why is nobody talking about the working class? And one of the most important question, uh, answers is that the industrial working class is much, much smaller than it was in 1965. Okay, that's very important to have in mind. And it's, it's decreasing every year due to mostly technological development and increase of productivity, but also due to globalization process and outsourcing of production to other countries. So, one part of the working class is replaced by machines, the other part is replaced by Bangladesh. <laughs> so, it's very important to have in mind that the old industrial working class plays um, not the same role like 40 years ago. And I think one problem of the social democracy was to ignore the new working class movements like the female service sector, which is much harder to organize than 2,000 people in one factory, which was easy. But today you have, I don't know, 100,000 to 50,000 um, employees in, the, in, 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 in um, uh, for example, Billa or Spa or something like this in hundreds of, um, hundreds of different places. So obviously um, there was a sociological change in working class and the, the left has not adapted. Um, okay. So this is uh, regarding a sociological uh, movement, a uh, development of the last 40 years. Um, let's talk about uh, so, uh, Zusammenhalt. Tommy, when I, when I listen to social democrats who are talking about Zusammenhalt, there are, there are two informations from my point of view. Huh? They, what they, they are praying, they are begging. First, they are begging. Dear, dear big corporations and rich people, Please keep the welfare state as it is, because it's important for everybody. Begging number one. Begging number two. Dear racists, please stop being racists, because it's mean towards immigrants. When I, when I listen to Gesellschaft uh, Sicherheit uh, to um, for me it's not a message of fight for your right. And I would prefer the message, fight for your right. And not... Uh, uh, um, uh, and, and we can change the society by ourselves, which is very different to the message um, if um, our social partners are reasonable, um, we can maintain our welfare state as it is. So it's, um, I think, Gesellschaft uh, Zusammenhalt is a conservative perspective and not a changing uh, of a uh, progressive one. And um, regarding internationalism, um, I just discussed it uh, with Chantal and Gabi three weeks ago when we were preparing uh, the discussion today and um, I told her about uh, my perspectives. Uh, you, you've, you've seen the text I, I've been uh, 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 writing. Um, I think it's, it's pretty easy from my, from my point of view. Global internationalism is something for the 22nd century. Okay? Because the world is is, is a very complicated place. But what we can try in the 21st century is to use the European Union or Europe as a tool to regain power towards global capital and big corporations. And if you want to re-establish the primacy of politics, I think we need a bigger instrument than Belgium, Austria, or even Germany. So, and as the European Union is not a small open economy that is dependent from foreign capital. It is one of the biggest economic areas in the world, biggest single market, biggest exporter, a closed economy not dependent from, uh, from foreign um, 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 economic uh, players. And it can make its own rules without um, risking anything. Huh? If we double wages in Austria, obviously there will be, objectively, competitive pressure in the exporting sector, which is very big in Austria. If we double 
uh, wages in Europe, <laughs> it, it, there, is, there is no way for capital to move a lot. So um, I think um, the international of the 21st century is to use the European level um, to regain um, primacy of politics. Um, okay, first, uh, 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 with respect to what Thomas was saying, I didn't say, and I did not that Thatcher imposed, <laughs> because I don't think she imposed. What I was trying to show is that she really uh, created a new hegemony, and created a new hegemony. Hegemony is the construction of consent, and, and I was explaining how she, in fact, managed to, to create a consent around uh, uh, his neoliberal, uh, neoliberal offensive, precisely uh, appealing to the question of uh, liberty, is he presenting the state as an oppressor, and that worked because people you know, were, in fact, uh, as I was saying, feeling that many of the advantages of the welfare state, and think of course it was an effect, but they were delivered in such a way that made them uh, feel, you know, a risk in, in a way that was demeaning. And I think that's, it, it's very important to, to see that, you know, it was not an imposition, it was creation of an hegemony. And it's precisely what the, the, the because of what I call the rationalism, the um, Labour Party did, did not uh, uh, you know, it is a completely deterministic view. I was saying, ah, oh, no, 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 no worry. When the, the uh, um, will be one million uh, unemployed people are going to react. You know, they, they, it's a completely wrong understanding of how oh, um, political identities are constructed, and is is basically what we criticize in the management strategy, what we call class essentialism. You know, so I think it's the, and the whole question is, no, no, hegemony is something different. And, uh, and so it was not an imposition. Uh, the question of um, a ribbon, well, of course, I agree that, uh, and I refer to very much to, to uh, something similar in my view, because I think that, uh, and this is this is which I, uh, uh, what Nikki say about uh, situation of writing properly, in Russia, my, we, we probably agree. Uh, uh, <laughs> I consider that. Uh, social democrats are great part responsible for the development of right-wing populism. Uh, social democrats, and of course it's different according to different countries, huh? obviously uh, I don't want to say that it's exact, but in general, in uh, the moment in which they move toward accepting that there was no alternative to neoliberal globalization, because I, th I think that's the crucial move. Once they believe that there is no alternative, they cannot have any discourse for the loser of neoliberal globalization. Because neoliberal globalization, of course, uh, has got winner and loser. And the, the popular classes, if I would prefer to speak of popular classes, because of course, you know, the working class, strictly speaking, has become much more, uh, the, but we can still speak of the popular classes. You know, there are employees, there are people who, strictly speaking, are not working class, but are also part of the loser of neoliberal globalization. And of course, if you believe that there is no alternative, how can you ever discourse with respect to those people? So you simply, you know, leave them aside. In fact, in France, it was so clear that there was, um, a few years ago, is a think tank called Terra Nova, who was Near, it was not exactly the, the, the part of the social place, but were very near, who published uh, an, an, an analysis of situation saying the working class are lost for us. You know, they are not going ever to uh, work for us. So we should up, let's forget about them and let's concentrate over, uh, over the middle class. So in fact, they offer the, the popular classes to, to Marine Le Pen because they were the only party during a long time in France, times not things are changing now with Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And this is why I'm saying that you know, the alternative to fighting populism is to develop a left populism. Is, uh, is, is Marine Le Pen was the only one who was going you know, and offering a discourse to those people. And of course, this is exactly what Eribon in Retour à Reims uh, shows with respect to his family and, and people you know, around. There were uh, uh, 
met mijn burgers, dan kwam ik eens paar keer op de Sociale Party en dan, 30 years later, of uh, 20 years later, when ik come back, they are all voting for Marine Le Pen. Because she's the only one who had at least to care about that problem. And I think that in many, many countries we've been seeing something similar, but precisely is because their conversion to neoliberalism. They, they could not offer. Uh, so I think that the only way in which we could recover some of those um, people who've been lost to right wing populism is to, by of a wrong breaking with post politics and offering a real, a real alternative. I think for me that's absolutely uh, crucial. Um, yeah, I think that I agree with what Nikki said about the uh, internationalism. And it's true, we did not discuss that, but I think that I, would, I don't think that the crisis of social democracy comes from an abandon of uh, internationalism. I mean, that's what is, there's, of course, there's things to say about, about that, but I don't think that, you know, this is where uh, um, the main issue, this is why I don't, uh, I did not particularly um, refer to that. And also, I, I think, so there is a lot of uh, discussion today among precisely people who are defending, uh, they are defending a left populist alternative. Uh, because left populists in, 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 in insist, and I think that from each other, that you need to start organizing people at the level of the nation state. First, first step, of course. Because this is where, if you want to recover some form of uh, democratic rights, you know, a place where they can be exercised is at the level of the nation state. And of course, we know that popular sovereignty is the big enemy of globalization. The only world globalization wants to get rid of, of that. So this is a site of resistance against the only world globalization. And of course, I agree with uh, uh, Nikki that, of course, once you've created that, you need to establish at the level of the European Union a convergence between those movements, because obviously one is not going to be able to fight against neoliberalism only in one country. That's absolutely true. Sure. But I think that it's also important to realize that internationalism includes some form of nationalism. Internationalism, because some people know there is a general discourse about some kind of you know extreme left to say that, oh, we, we should uh, uh, really think organizing at the global level, and anything that uh, insists on more local thing is necessarily fascistic. I mean, that's the position one finds, for instance, in Aston and Negri very much. The local is fascistic. I think we need to begin organizing uh, the local, or the regional, or the national, and of course, at the level of the European Union. For me, that, that and, and, you know, kind of, so oh, internationalism, and what about, you know, it's, it's, yeah, maybe for the 22nd century. century. Uh, um, but, you know, the moment the, the, that the main task is to organize you know, nationally and at the level of the European Union. Well, I think we should slowly come to an end, if you agree, but, um, or is there some, there's some opportunity at, towards after this, with a glass of water <laughs> to uh, continue um, discussions. But there is one uh, point that I would like to take up because it was one of the last things that um, Egon Matzner was devoting his attention to, which is the role of the what he called the res publica. And I think I, Eva, I mean, I, Eva pointed at this, which role versus market or civil society, what is the role of the state and the, not just the state, but the supra-state, European Union or even global, but what is the role of race publica versus private or civil society or whatever. And that was something he thought should be, was crucial to, to, um, to clarify, to, to sort of think about and to, to decide about because in view of all this privatization, liberalization, derealization, he was, he was thinking that this was a crucial question. But this was my last point. If, um, Stephanie, you want to say something? Very, very shortly, I would like to draw your attention, before you go and grab a glass of wine, I would like to draw your attention to the beautiful exhibition we have here because it's actually the artist is sitting there moderating. 
And <laughs> just so that you get to know it, it's uh, very nice. And um, just now we are happy to invite you for a glass of wine. Thank you very much uh, for, you. for you being here. Thank you that you came on such a beautiful and hot day. And please enjoy a glass of wine, get engaged with each other, and look at the beautiful pictures. You can also buy them. So uh, <laughs> thank you.